For the first time this season, the Clippers were able to put their two stars together on the court at the same time. To add to the intrigue, they were playing at home against the East's best team, giving us one of the best games of the season that needed overtime to decide the victor. While it might have been sloppy and uneven, it was also epic and heroic, culminating in a shot from one corner that tickled the twine and another shot from the corner that was tickled by Kawhi. Let's start by looking at how the Clippers want to integrate Paul George and Kawhi Leonard into their offense. They start off on the same side, with George cutting through to allow Leonard to replace him at the top. This pin down doesn't generate an attack, but they flow into a step-up screen where Marcus Smart drifts to the roll man incorrectly. This is Tatum's help, and as a result, he gives up a good catch and shoot to one of the better shooters in the game. Notice how much gravity Kawhi sucks in on this pick and roll. The Celtics were double teaming either Kawhi or Paul when they got a ball screen. Again, Smart is two steps too far over to his right. Tatum would be the proper help here, and it's just enough space for Kawhi to kick to Paul George for his own three from the right wing. It looks like they're going to put George and Leonard on opposite sides of the court more often than not, and this steal off the blitz of the pick and roll served to encourage the defense to do it more and more. This time they put Kawhi in the right corner and run the pick and roll for George going to the left side. Smart plays this perfectly, stunting towards the roll man, then getting right back to Kawhi in the corner. When Zubots comes over to set up corner screen, they foolishly double, providing an easy pass for Kawhi to get Zubots the slam dunk. Again, these two start on opposite sides, but they shuffle cut Kawhi to the low block, where he can face up before rising up over Jalen Brown for the tough long two. A key to maximizing this two-man juggernaut is pushing the ball to force mismatches. With Beverly pushing the pace, the Celtics had a second where Brown could have gotten to the ball and bumped Tice out of there to guard the trailing Zubats. Instead, it's Brown involved in this defense and is way out of position as Smart forces George away from the screen, but Brown is not on the line of deployment between the ball and the basket. Tice does the proper rotation to help from the weak side. Tatum makes a mistake by helping from the strong side, and here's a nice George to Kawhi pass for the check the wind on so wide open three-pointer. I know it's a real concern to go against an offense with both Kawhi and PG in it, but the constant blitzing yielded great shots. Kawhi pulls the double out to half court perfectly, forcing Tatum to have to stay at home for an extra second before closing out, and that's all Mo Harkless needs to launch and splash. Kawhi had moments of rust out there, having missed the previous three games, and this possession started out in horns with George in the right corner and Kawhi in the left elbow. They were going to run elbow get action, but on the switch, Kawhi has a mouse in the house. The Akemba keeps him contained until Leonard turned his back, with Tatum timing an excellent double team and forcing the turnover. More rust as Kawhi struggles to bring the ball up against Marcus Smart and just dribbles it out of bounds. We didn't get to see any Kawhi PG pick and roll, sadly, but they did set one for Kawhi with Lou Williams. Well contained by the Celtics, but Leonard still gets this floating over the backboard moonshot to somehow drop clean through the net. What? This is the scariest lineup the Clippers can run out there with Lou, Trez, Bev, PG, and Kawhi. And what a nice treat when your top two guys can rest and let Mr. Williams go to work on the snake dribble pull up at the free throw line. On the Celtics side, Tatum was the brightest spot in terms of scoring, and he had a heck of a third quarter from the on the arc. Here, he pulled the old get Paul George to kick his trail foot and fall down so I can fade to the weak side corner, get the long skip, double pump, and then still hit the shot. On this action, Tatum has a choice of screening for Smart or going to get the handoff himself. Tice thinks better of it, and this flows into a pin down by Tatum for Kemba, who rejects it to cut back door, leading Tatum to get a pitch to pick. Unclear why Beverly would go looking back down towards the hoop. The switch had already happened, so he gets caught under the screen, and Tatum does a gorgeous hop into the shot for the splash. Again, Tatum looks to cross screen when Kemba rejected to go back door. Tice completely misses the pass for the easy layup, but does flow into a ball screen where he throws a jab to get Beverly way out of position, then uses the screen to find some daylight and knock down yet another bomb from deep. If you don't believe in the hot hand, well, folks, I simply present to you this shot. On this pitch to pick, Tatum puts his defender in jail, 
then continues to probe the lane until he can find this gorgeous inside hand layup for his 14th point of the quarter. If you remember all that doubling on the pick and roll by the Celtics, it came back to haunt them at the end of the game. The short roll to Harrell forces Tatum to rotate over, and Smart should have remained exactly between Lou and Kawhi, wait for the pass, then close out. Instead, Kawhi's tractor beam sucked him in, and there's no way to get Lou out in time, but they dodged the bullet. With a six-point lead and three and a half to go, the Celtics needed merely to be competent on the offensive end and solid on defense, and they have this game. They push the ball up to force a mismatch with Lou guarding Tatum down low. While the pass wasn't great from Kemba, this is more on Tatum to maintain his position and not let Lou step in front and steal it. At this point, I understand that Marcus Smart is probably exhausted, and as a result, is caught half asleep and standing straight up and down as his man Kawhi is catching the ball, blowing right by him, and then cold catching the body of Daniel H. Tice. Somebody call the cops. A crime has been committed, and there are plenty of witnesses. Still up four, the Celtics let Smart run the show instead of Kemba. Hmm. But the screen out top leads to another rescreen lower on the court, and it gets space for the little jumper despite Beverly's protest from the outside. And this brings us to a crucial call that I needed none other than Ronnie Nunn to weigh in on. Ronnie was an NBA referee for 19 years, head of officials for five, and director of development for three more, and is my go-to guy for a deeper understanding of what the officials are doing out there and why. So, Ronnie, we got some issues here. We have a Paul George drive deep in the fourth quarter. A couple things are happening here. We got Paul George getting a little frisky with his hands. We got Jalen Brown getting a little provocative with his. So what do you see here, and what do you think the uh, call was, if it was correct or not? You know, uh, now should I answer correct first or should I answer incorrect first? <laughs> <laughs> let's go with the, let's go with the, how about in order of what you see? Okay, and, and that's a good one. In order of what I see is I see a decent drive. And of course, the offensive player, I notice he puts his forearm up to clear space. He actually dislodges the player. Uh, had he not done that, he might have got a blocking foul uh, because now he clearly is out of the way to defend her. And now we go into the second phase of the shot. Now, that is a play that is right on the borderline of of, was he completely wiped out or not. So let's just say it's 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 marginal and let's continue to play. Really? Okay. so you think that I think it's a pretty provocative move, but I almost feel like he misses the defender a little bit where had he gotten complete contact with the forearm and the fist and the whole thing that would have forced the refs to maybe call that foul. Yeah, I, I think that's fine. Again, it funnels down to what I think it's 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 borderline. He didn't get him as good as he wanted to. It, it would have been much easier for everybody. But I think as the play continues, I'm okay with that part of it. Okay. Uh, as we continue the play and and uh, he goes up for his shot, um, which is not a complete layup kind of a shot. It's kind of a, a, a short jump shot out of it, sort of a, a, a layup with a turn for a shot. And, and then the defender puts his arm on his body while the player is alighted. That is an issue in basketball for shooters. Uh, if you're doing a straight layup, it might not show itself as being as, as difficult to, to, to call a foul on. You might also call that marginal contact. So we have now marginal contact versus illegal when he's in the air. And that extended arm is what that referee now calls. Um, a couple of pieces of the of the views on it. When we look at it on the uh, uh, on the view that uh, the television looks at it initially, it looks like uh, you know it's not a foul. But when you look on the side that the official is calling it from the sideline, and you look at it that time, then you can see why he may have a foul on the play. It's interesting that two views give two illusions. I agree. In fact, I almost feel like the, the, the regular television view and then the one you're referencing give you a good sense of that there is enough, even though it's a quick touch, it's enough to make the guy drift farther. The other reviews make it, to, to, to me, make it seem like, uh, it's, you know, it didn't really do much. And certainly the reaction was incredulous. But we all know it's an, that's an old pro trick, right? You kind of just give him a little bit of a jab on the way up and you get out of there before the ref can see it or maybe before it makes it look like a, anything that affected it. But I think what you're trying to say, what we, what we all know is, yeah, once you're gliding in the air, uh, even a little bit of some bumps uh, can really affect uh, your balance and your shot. 
Yeah, and I think that's how the play ends. Now, that's not to give allowances to to the original push-off a little bit with the left arm. I mean, he clears a little space with the left arm, but he doesn't really go completely elbow to wrist. He just uses it as an arm guard a little bit, and it creates a little contact. It does throw the defender off his balance. Uh, maybe he can't keep up with George either, so it makes him you know, a little, little tougher to keep up. But the play in the air is a critical thing in basketball all the time, particularly when it's a turnaround kind of a layup shot. It's not a layup shot. It's kind of like a, I'm in the air turning now as if I had launched from that location. Now when you have your hand on somebody, especially the strength of our players, uh, uh, and for every level going up, no matter what the strength is for each level, that's what will, will take a player out of his, uh, his, his shooting uh, you know, rhythm. And, 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 that's, and that's the problem. Just to clear it up for the fans, this call was challenged by Brad Stevens, and they simply can only look at whether the Brown contact was a foul on the shot. They can't go back even on a challenge and then decide that there was an offensive foul earlier on in that play, right? No, he's going for the play in which he, he, he deems is the issue for his challenge. And uh, so the buildup of that is, is something else. Again, this is a problem. Now, listen, the person that really knows whether he was pushed enough is the guy that's shooting the shot, you know, and in the park, someone would say, uh, you fouled me, you know, <laughs> and another guy would say, oh, come on, I just touched you. There wasn't really a foul. So the, the both guys that are in the game know it. Now you're trying to get a third party in to make a judgment on how bad it was. Again, you got to go back to the principle and a lighted player on a shot of that nature. Uh, it's foolish to put your hand on him. To um, you know, to just touch him in the way he did because you can't throw him off. The Celtics again let Smart run the show out top, turning Kemba into a two guard, and the Clippers display excellent positional defense as George covers for Kawhi and Harrell until they can get back. Closes back out to Smart, who hits him with a gorgeous behind the back dribble. And believe it or not, this was not meant as a shot. The lob pass was tipped by Harrell right into the rim. Time is running out for the Clippers, and rather than contain to force more time off the clock, the Celtics continue to double. Kemba has to rotate to the short roller in Harrell, and it appears the game plan is for Smart to stay home on Kawhi no matter what. I think this is a mistake. If he splits the difference between Kawhi and Beverly, he can close out to the first pass, and Kemba would have time to close out in the second. There's no way Kemba can get all the way back before Bev lets this one fly, cold swishing it to cut the lead to four. The Celtics went to the wind the clock down with a four-point lead, but it does put you in danger of having to burp up a bad shot at the end of the shot clock. And when they switch twice in a row, it's on Lou to hang with Kemba, who kind of bails him out with the gallop three-pointer, contested well, and it breaks. More importantly, it leaves the Celtics out of position to get back well. Tatum gets entranced by the ball, forgetting he needs to find a man to pick up. It would have been Harold who gets the deep position and muscles it up and in to cut the lead to two. Under a minute left, the Celtics run so much clock down that when they get Kemba going downhill and collapsing the defense, the right play would have been an extra pass from Smart to Brown in the corner, but the shot clock won't let him. It honestly looks like this shot was an air ball, and so was the putback, so the refs should have blown the whistle for a shot clock violation. And man, would Boston have preferred that since the Clippers find Lou cherry-picking at the three-point line, and he calmly buries the three to somehow take the lead for the Clippers. I mean, what? It looked like all was lost as Kemba tried to turn the corner and just loses the ball to Lou, forcing Boston to foul, where Lou is perfect from the line and puts them up by three. When you're down three, you want to get the best shot you can as early as you can, and Tatum gets George running, then it appears as if he steps on the inseam of George's shoe, causing him to fall. There's a shuffle of the feet, but who's counting, especially since he rises up and buries his clutch shot to tie the game and force the Clippers into another possession. Wow! Unclear why they wouldn't have set a screen with Kemba's man to force a switch and let Kawhi go to work. Instead, they're on an island, Kawhi jacks it up, and we're heading to overtime. In the extra frame, they flare Tatum to the right side, where the jab step gets Kawhi leaning, the tight screen gives him separation, and a nice mid-range falls for a Celtic lead. Sometimes long rebounds just happen, and while Kemba did try and box out, 
It's Beverly who just has a nose for the ball and gets the board, kicks it back out, and this time Paul ain't missing to give the Clippers the lead right back. Tice just throws the ball to Kawhi's claw, and back in transition, I needed Ronnie Nunn to weigh in on this play as well. Well, Ronnie, we have to get your expertise here on a block charge. Middle of the overtime, crucial part of the game on the fast break. Montrez Harrell gets the centering pass at the basket, and we have Kemba Walker trying to take a charge. Well, we saw what the ref called, but now we got to figure out how he got to that point. So give us some insight into what happened in this call and why it went as a block. These are plays that will come up more often today because referees are getting too low in the front court. The referee that's involved in outside play, the trail official, he's getting too close to the towards the basket in the front court. So now when you have a transition, he's really got to catch up. Now, it was uh, an incredible X mark on your on your uh, on your report if you didn't get to that baseline faster than the players did. Now, there are situations on steals. There's no question that you have to follow a play. But he is on the sideline almost almost towards the corner making this call. So I'm believing he's thinking lateral movement. I'm believing he's thinking uh, after a, a player gathers the ball on a catch, he has the one step down. Um, the, is the one step permissible to get down? Yes. Can he get it down? Yes. Why? Because Kemba Walker is in place. There is slight a uh, slight movement to his right to, uh, it, for the center of his body. But let's keep it simple. K-I-S-S. Let's keep it simple in knowing that this play really reads offensive foul. And when you see those kind of plays, you don't get so critical on every little particular slight movement. Uh, Kemba is there. The player follows with the, the second foot. And then all of a sudden he hits. He gathers, I believe, on his right. And then he gets his left down, but he gets it down actually uh, too late, where he can't stop his momentum. Now, if he couldn't get that second foot down after the gather step, I like the block call. But he gets it down, and he also has to realize, uh, the referee, that he's calling a play that has to do with block charge and his position on lateral movement. And as we look at it, we get the benefit of seeing lateral movement. It's very, very minimum. Let's keep it simple. Call it offensive. So is I always thought we would talk about this in the past that there isn't really a component of having both feet down on the ground set to take a charge. Um, so clarify that part of the rule. Does he have to have both feet on the ground set in a perfect path of the of the offensive player to take that charge? If remember though, he catches, he's got one foot down. So on the catch, if somebody was in, let's take this play and move it at midcourt. If a guy catches a ball at midcourt, he's got one foot down, and he's, his momentum, the speed of the play, he now wants to stride to get his second foot down, and he can't get it down because the defender is there. That's a blocking foul. Just like if a player caught it in the air at the same place at midcourt or wherever, and he goes to land, and he can't land, it's a blocking foul, even though the defender was there. In this case, there's a catch and then a step after the catch. He's got to have that step. By the way, he gets that step and now goes into a Kemba who's in place. So it's an offensive foul. Yeah, there's lateral movement a little bit by Kemba as he squares up a tad, but his right foot is down and in place to receive contact. And then hence legal guarding position. So, Ronnie, thank you so much for breaking this down for us. I'm not sure it's going to make any Celtics fans feel any better about this, but at least we can get some clarity. Yeah, uh, this is this is a, a judgment call. It's a tough negotiated ball. Let me let me not say uh, let me say that for sure, so everybody knows it's really a tough play. But that's the science and protocol behind the play and the art of the play as well. Awesome. Well, Ronnie, thanks for coming on. I can't wait to hook up with you again to find the next call we got to deal with. And uh, again, we'll see you in the next one. Very good, Coach. Good to be with you. Running PG off a double pin down, the Celtics contain this absolutely perfectly. Look where Tice is and how Brown maintains contact. Forced to reset, George turns the corner. This is good help by Kemba as the lowest man on defense, but it's Tatum's turn to ignore his rotation to just stick with Kawhi. He was several steps closer to close out. Instead, Beverly gets going by getting the open shot from the corner to go down. There was plenty of time left, but Stevens does his team no favors by getting a technical foul and a free point to extend the lead for the Clippers. The ref did his best to not blow his whistle, and Stevens needs to be better about reading the body language. 
but there is some life as Boston executes their sideline out of bounds play. In a very common action, Brown sets a back screen for the inbounder, getting good contact with Pat Bev. Lou didn't switch, and it leaves the layup at the rim. Still down only two, they strangely turn to Smart to run the show. He tends to be woefully inconsistent, and here's an example where this isn't a bad shot per se, but how can a pro airball an open floater from 13 feet? After all the times I've broken down the Celtics pick and roll defense, you'd think they would adjust and stop the foolishness. Nope, they double high, the Clippers hit the short roll, and again, they refuse to leave Kawhi on the weak side. There's no way Tatum could ever rotate to the midline in the lane and then get back out there. Had Smart split the difference between Beverly and Kawhi, he would then close out on the first pass while Tatum or Kemba could be closing out to the second shooter. This didn't happen, and the Clippers just about iced the game. Yet another out-of-bounds play by Stevens run to perfection. Pull everybody high and wide, Beverly assumes he's going to switch with Kawhi, but Kawhi never got the memo. Here's where you gotta forget all the issues with Smart and just love him for what he can do on the court. He makes the catch to Kawhi virtually impossible, and check how he lays out at the same time deflecting the ball off his foot to give his team a legit shot at tying this up. Execution is key, but they can't get a clean pass to Tice, who is going to run a dribble handoff for Kemba. Instead, it goes to Tatum, who has no time but to toss up this contested three. When they get the rebound, Beverly does the smart thing and takes the foul they had to give in order to prevent them from hitting a three. And that leads to the last play. Celtics needing a three. Harrell assumes Kemba is cutting up to the top, so he cheats the position. Kemba expertly reads that and cuts out to the corner where it looked like he had enough time to let it fly, but not when the claw is in the vicinity. Swatting this away and sealing a game the Clippers had frankly stolen from the visiting Celtics in what was, I think, the best game of the season so far, and very possibly a preview into the NBA Finals. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to B-Ball Breakdown so you can get alerted right away when we drop a new video. This season will be filled with incredible content, so don't miss it. You in?